Hi, I'm Patricia Allingham Carlson, and this is my video of how I painted Afterglow. I've just returned from a very lovely vacation to the Delaware Seashore. One of the real eye treats of that vacation is having a prime, prime view of the sunset. The sun goes down over the bay, over a distant marina, and over the marshes. The marshes are a really unique area full of wildlife. All kinds of different birds and clams and oh, you name it, it's in there. Not exactly a place you want to walk yourself, but there are some paths through, and we often go clamming there. Anyway, I hope you'll like it. I hope you'll give it a thumbs up and ring the bell and subscribe. Now let's paint. This is a small piece. It's only seven inches across by five inches tall. And I wanted to just do something quick and beautiful and fresh for my memory of the sunsets over the marshes. I began by masking in some little light areas. Now this is called afterglow because it's after the full glory of the sunset when the sun blooms up and sends a glow through the remaining clouds. The colors can sometimes be the most spectacular that you'll see in any sunset ever. So it is starting to get dark at this point and some lights are coming on in the marina down the street. I've tried out some different colors on the right to begin with, I wet the whole upper surface with just plain water and a wide brush, and now I'm beginning to paint in bands of color. This first color is a permanent rose color. You can see where it's starting to bloom at the top. And next, right on it, I'm coming in with some cadmium orange. Now, as luck would have it, it was getting a little dry already, so I had to keep re-wetting with some strips of water and forcing a blend. My next strip of color is cadmium yellow. And my next colors are going to end up being blues. Now you know what happens when you mix blue and yellow together, and I didn't really want that to happen. There might be a hint of green in the sky, but it wasn't what I wanted to do as a predominant sky. Can you see that I'm trying to leave a faint area where the colors are not blending? I plan to paint the clouds in across that area. The light strip I just painted was very diluted cobalt blue. And to finish off the top, I'm using ultramarine blue. Now these colors are very concentrated because my colors in the sky were so bright. I figured if I mix them up and put in a lot of concentrated color, maybe they wouldn't all fade off into oblivion, being painted wet on wet. We'll see what happens. Last, I mixed up some Thilo Blue with some Quin Magenta because there were some very dark clouds and some silhouettes along the bottom of distant bushes and trees. It was almost hard to distinguish which was which, but they were a deep bluish purple. And those are the colors that worked for me to create that color. After I painted it on, I'm using just a little bit of water to try to allow a blend. And then I'm taking the tip of my paintbrush to begin to paint in the clouds that are going in light stripes across the sky. If only the paper hadn't dried quite so quickly, the task would have been a lot smoother. But I figured I could do some blending later if needed.
And here, putting in this layer of clouds, you can see I'm covering over the transitional layer, where I tried to keep the yellow from running into the blue and turning the whole sky green. Last, there was a very good dark strip of clouds at the very top, and they were running between the pale blue and the darker blue. This area was almost entirely dry. So I was not getting the beautiful flow and spread of color such as what I wanted. I wet my brush and went across the entire bottom as I'm doing now with water, hoping that the flow would be a little easier and the cloud transition a little softer. And now I'm doing the same in the top area. I'm adding some more dark color mostly indigo and with a bit of Payne's gray to bring the clouds out more strongly. And trying once again to soften the bottom of those clouds with water. At a certain point, I realized everything was just going to have to dry completely. And I came back to it the next day. Here I have a wide flat brush and I'm doing some color lifting because some of the colors actually dried a little bit too intense for me. So I'm painting some damp water on top and removing some color to try to make them look more like what I'm looking at on the image I took. Now you see where the orange runs into the blue? There's sort of a line there and I didn't want a hard edge. I wanted a softer edge. So I repeatedly go over that with my damp brush, lift color, and try to soften that edge. And now it's getting more to my satisfaction as I lift a little bit of color. I'm also going to be adding more cadmium yellow to that permanent pink color, just to have a little bit less pink and a little bit more of a coral color. I've wet the top clouds down and I've mixed some more of the thylo blue with a little bit of the quin magenta to bring out a more purple color at the bottom of that top cloud layer. I'm also enhancing the cloud layer at the top with some darker pigment. Going in to soften some of the little cloud strips that go across that were too hard edge because the paint was getting too dry and the paper was getting too dry. So I had to do the reworking, <coughs> excuse me, and I did so with my damp brush. Now down at the bottom, where these deep purple clouds are, I begin to paint in the silhouettes of trees, buildings, and bushes along the horizon.
This is a roof line going in. These buildings are not out in the marshes. One is in front of the marshes and the rest are way beyond in the marina down the street. I'm keeping these building forms very uh, soft focus because the light was so low at this point you can hardly even see that they're buildings except for the fact that they have some lights which you'll see when I remove the masking. Now I'm ready to block in the foreground. The foreground is almost entirely in silhouette. In fact, I really can't see anything clear in my photograph that I took, but I know that the marshes are full of tall, swishing grasses. So I'm wondering, should I leave this big plain area here? Or maybe add just a small bit of detailing. I liked how the horizontal strokes I put on seemed to add a little character to the foreground. So I let them remain as painted. I'm tightening up my roof lines a little bit on the closest building. And back to those clouds. I am softening the edges a little more with a damp brush. And I did do a number of adjustments all throughout this painting time to these clouds because I wanted them to look like clouds and not hard clunky objects in the sky. Now clouds can have a hard edge, but to my eyes, this scene needed a soft edge for the clouds. And you can see that going over it repeatedly with a damp brush is helping. At this point, I had decided that the pink needed to be coming down just a little bit with a wee bit of cadmium yellow. And that's what I'm doing, is adding some cadmium yellow at this point. Now, I like the pink, but maybe it was a little too much. And I wanted a better blend into the orange. So yellow provided a nice transition point there. Then I wondered, what if I put those grasses in? Would they even show in the foreground? So I started with some Payne's Gray going over the foreground. Putting in random strokes, tall, short, different directions. And what I found was that they quickly faded into being gone. So I decided to try some black. I don't use a lot of black when I paint, but in this case the foreground truly was just plain dark. So I painted in some of these tall grasses using the tip of a brush for nice thin lines going back in the, fore in the background toward the middle ground. I made the, the blades much shorter and I made them much taller in the foreground. There's one little section where I removed some color so I could try to clarify the, the roof line on the building on the right. But I will be filling that in. If 
Can you just see those blades of grass? I think it adds something to the foreground and I decided to keep them. Coming back in next to the building, I'm using my original purplish blue color to fill in that little blank spot. The sky is essentially done. The foreground is essentially done. I think it's going to be time to remove those masking spots soon. But first, there are a couple of scraggly, squabbly pine trees and some telephone poles silhouetted against the sunset. Now when you have a painting that's primarily horizontal like this one, it's nice to have a couple of vertical lines to break up all the horizontality and add some interest in a different way. I have to use a very, very thin edge to make distant telephone poles and signs and things showing up against the sunset. And I have to use a lot of patience. If I mess this up and make a big fat wide line where I went delicate and small, I'm going to have to figure out how to fix it without messing up my sky. So it's really better to take your time and go slow. Naturally the telephone poles will get a little taller as they progress toward the right side of the page. And they'll be at the very shortest on the far left which is going down the road. I'm not even going to think of painting in the wires that go between them because that would be even too delicate to show, especially at this time of night. Now one of these telephone poles up in the very front have some viney growth covering, covering it halfway up. So I'm adding that as well as what is growing up on the pine tree to the left of it. I try to keep it asymmetrical in order to keep it natural looking. And now I'm removing the masking. And there's the little lights shining along the line of civilization in all this wild marshland. I'm getting all the masking off completely with an eraser. Some of these lights appeared blue, some of them appeared golden, and a couple appeared red. So I'll paint them in, leaving a lot of white with whatever color they seem to be appearing. Here I'm using Quinn Gold. And I'm going around the edges of my white and I'm trying to keep the Quinn gold from mixing with all the indigo and all the Payne's gray of the house because that color is not very attractive when they mix. I'm adding touches to the other light areas as well. First of the Quinn gold. Whenever the colors start to mix and look like an awful mustard color, I wash my brush, dry it, and bring in some clean color.
that light was quite red. So I did bring the red in and I tried putting a little of the red around the Quinn Gold in the closest building. Because that was sort of an orange, amber, gold color. But I'm keeping that white as the primary color in the center because it stands out the strongest. A little bit of cobalt blue into that one. As well as the other one. Again, keeping whites. This is delicate work. You don't want to cover your whites over. Now I'm covering up the edges of the painting so I can see how it looks when it will be cut to a mat. I've taken a white dip pen. I'm using white ink and I'm signing my name so it will show up in the foreground. I'm writing my name backwards because I'm a left-handed person and if I wrote it across the other way, I might obliterate it as I wrote it. I'm using wet white ink. It's not a real easy task, but I'm taking my time and I get it done eventually. And once it's signed, the painting's done. How would you have signed something like this? I didn't want to make the signature up in the sky. And this was the only way I could figure that it would work. And it's done. I hope you enjoyed my video, Afterglow. Again, this was a painting of the Delaware Seashore area. And we could view this beautiful sunset each night. I hope you enjoyed it. You'll give it a thumbs up and ring the bell below to subscribe. Then you won't miss a single video that's coming up. There's some other links for you to check out as well in the below section. Have you ever painted a sunset? Did you have as much fun as I did with this one? I value your questions, your comments, and anything you might want to write. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next video.